Well, welcome to Vineyard. My name is Parker. Guys, it's officially summer. Like, yeah. Summer is officially here. So excited for that, except I haven't been to the beach yet. So I need to make a beach day. Can't wait to you know, put my feet in the sand, jump into what I'm sure is freezing cold water. Because um, it's Virginia Beach. But uh, yeah, and I'm really excited for summer. And also coming up, we have a regional conference July 12th through the 14th. It's going to be amazing. Um, so if you haven't signed up yet, please feel free to do so after service in the hallway. Um, but this year's conference is all about being refreshed by God and allowing Him to just uh, you know, keep us going, renew us. Um, which I'm excited for because I feel like I never get enough rest. You know, do you guys ever try to plan like a relaxation day? <laughs> just a day for yourself where you either do nothing all day or everything you do is specifically for yourself, you know? Like get your hair cut, um, go to the gym, maybe go to a movie that you want to see, that nobody else will see, but you want to go. <laughs> I feel like any time I try to do that, something always gets in the way. Something always happens, you know? Um, it's normally one of two things. First thing, something completely unexpected shows up, you know? Um, your kid gets sick, uh, emergency meeting at work, you forgot about that doctor's appointment, you know? Hey Parker, it's Dr. Smith from your dentist's office. Just wondering if you're coming in today. Yeah, man, I'm right around the corner, you know? Just haven't even gotten dressed yet. <laughs> or two, you're so exhausted from the work week that you have no physical or mental capacity to do anything. So you just do nothing. Nothing that you plan. Um, to be honest, that's normally me. I feel like I'm going from the moment that I wake up to the moment that I go to sleep, and I repeat that every single day, and I get my day off, and I just can't do anything. I maybe accomplish one or two things. And normally waking up early, going to the gym, um, showering at the gym, getting to work at five minutes late, um, and I'm working all day, my meeting goes late, so I'm late home, I gotta clean a messy house, and then I have to make myself dinner, or to be honest, go to Chick-fil-A. Um, and then I gotta study for school, and then I gotta go to sleep on time, so I wake up early again and go to the gym. It just never stops. So by the time that I get to my day off, which is Monday, I maybe like go to the gym, clean up a little bit, and then I just binge watch Netflix the rest of the day. I'm just gonna be honest. My days off aren't very productive, but I feel like there's a couple reasons why we get in these seasons of life. First, overcommitment. Maybe financial struggle, or that's just, it's just, it just is. It is the way it is. That's just the life that we live at this current moment. Um, so I'd like to share a story with you guys from when I was like smack dab in the middle of this season. I was a full-time student at Reed University, part-time church staff member, and a full-time waiter at Max and Irma's in Town Center, which is no longer there. Um, it's closed down, so don't go there. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I, I was serving for about six months at this point. Um, I was doing pretty well for my first time. They, they wanted me to be a certified trainer. I started gathering regulars or people that would request me when they came into the restaurant. But I've been going pretty solid for a couple of weeks. I didn't have a day off between church, school, um, and the restaurant. And so finally I was like, you know what? I'm going to request a day off. Just for me, I'm going to enjoy this. So it's the day before that, and um, I'm working my last shift at the restaurant. So excited for my next day. My manager comes up to me. She says, hey Parker, I know you don't work tomorrow, but a party of 30 called in, and they want you to be their witness. I'm just gonna leave it up there. And then she walked away. So, you know what? I came into work, <laughs> I needed the money. And I got there early, and I set up the table, um, I put plates out, I put napkins out, straws, got the water ready, I was good to go. And so as, as they start com coming in, um, I recognized a couple of the ladies that were my regulars. They were retired Navy women, super hilarious, super awesome, and they brought 25 of their retired Navy women friends. So I knew it was going to be great. I knew my tip was about to be amazing. It was just going to be a good day for me. And my manager promised me I could leave right afterwards. So um, normally with a party of, of this you know, magnitude, they, they give you a server that helps you. So you have an aide. Um, so we start taking drink orders um, together, and then all of a sudden, the restaurant gets slammed packed. So my manager comes to me, like, hey, I promised you someone would help you. I gotta take him away to serve his own section. I was like, great. So now it's just me and 30 women. <laughs> so I got a little overwhelmed. Um, but I kept going. I brought the drinks out on time. Um, I, I take their appetizer orders. Um, I'm getting the appetizers out on time. I take their food orders, um, put it in, and now it's the food is ready. Now, 30 meals is a lot to bring out to a table. So the kitchen staff is helping me, which is awesome. So they're plating everything for me. They're putting it on trays. Um, so I grab the first tray, and these trays are like this big, roughly. So I'm holding it like this. 
Um, and I walk it out, I put it on the table, come back, I grab the second tray, bring it to the table, whip out the meals, third tray, bring it out, put it on the table, everything's going smooth, grab the last tray, I cannot believe it to be done. You know, it's been about an hour, I can see the words, and we have to check in my future. And I pray it is one, not three. Um, so I grab the last tray, I'm coming out of the kitchen, and out of nowhere, my coworker rounds the corner and knocks my tray. The tray hits me in the neck, and I fall backwards. Hamburgers, <coughs> french fries, salads, tortilla soup, all over me. And I'm laying there on the ground. I don't want to get up. I don't want to clean. I don't want to keep going. I just want to go home at this point. You ever have those moments where things just like go in slow motion? So I can just, I remember I was falling backwards. No. My life is flashing before my eyes. I could be at home right now, watching the Kardashians. But anyway, I get back up, I clean off, I change my shirt. Luckily, I have one in my car. Um, and then I finish out the table, uh, cash out their check, and I sit down at the employee table and order my meal. And I'm really excited for this meal because I got the greasy food on the menu. I got an appetizer sampler, sucked out all the healthy stuff, and put in all the greasy stuff, because I was treating myself today. Um, so I'm sitting down, I'm enjoying my meal, um, and then a coworker sits down with me at the table. I don't know what he thought he was doing, because you know, I just didn't want to talk to anybody now. Um, I'm sure he heard what happened. Um, so he starts talking to me, and you know when people talk to you, and you don't really pay attention? So you're like, they're talking, like, yeah. Right, yeah. Dang. Truly <laughs> you're right, yeah, that's so crazy. But that's what I was doing most of the time. And then for some reason, I felt the need to look up. So I look up, and this dude, who normally is like the happiest guy in the world, jack of all trades, like if you asked him to do anything in that entire restaurant, he would be able to do it. Um, and he seemed a little down. And I felt the need to ask him what was going on. I said, hey man, you okay? Is everything, I mean, no, you heard about my day. But are you okay? And he was like, man, it's been a tough month. He's like, what's going on? He tells me he has two daughters that he's raising on his own. He's financially responsible for everything that they do. And he's just having a really hard time supporting them. He's working overtime. He doesn't want to disappoint his little girls. Can you believe that in that moment, in the height of my stress, God gave me the opportunity to lead this man to trust in Jesus? In the middle of my embarrassment, I had the biggest headache you could possibly imagine. God allowed me to do that. I will not remember that day for the stress. You know, I will remember for that moment, what God did in that moment. See, why is it that we get so caught up in our tasks or our actions that we forget what God wants to do with us? Or what his plan is? Or better yet, during my message, I want you to think about this question. Why is it that we get so caught up in our tasks that we forget what God wants to do? in our tasks. Right. I have a tweetable thought for you guys. You can post it on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat. Um, the tweetable thought is, there's purpose to my service. At Vineyard VA, hashtag join up. There's purpose to your service. A lot of times we assume God wants us to take some time away from everything that we're doing, like our jobs, our careers, our commitments, and Jesus don't go together. They're mutually exclusive. They can't happen at the same time. See, God wants our everyday lives to be meaningful. I didn't go to work that day because I had to, because God had bigger plans that I wasn't aware of. I'd like to share a story with you from the Bible about two sisters who have two very different lifestyles. The first one um, has a lot of free time, very peaceful woman. And the second one has a pretty hectic, busy life. So let's jump into this, Luke 10, verse 38. It's on your outline, also on the screens. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care about my sister? That she has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed or indeed only one. Mary hasn't chosen what is better and it will not be taken away from her. I feel like most of the time when we read this story, Mary is seen as the saint, and Martha is seen as the girl that needs to get her life straight. Which isn't entirely false. 
However, most of the time we fail to see one thing. Martha is the definition of a servant. She works hard, and there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with us working hard, too. See, I'm not here today to tell you to slow down, to stop working so much, and to read your Bible. Those are good things to do. See, here at Vineyard, we understand that most of the time, people work full-time jobs, and then they volunteer here. Ushers, readers, worship team, children's ministry, youth ministry, volunteer work. Normally, this story is used as an anti-serving lesson. It's an opportunity for you to say, you know what, I'm not going to serve for about a decade, let my kids grow up and leave the house, then I'll come back. But I want to propose something a little bit. I think God is trying to teach us something different through this story. Brings me to my first point. Jesus places a high value on my service. Jesus places a high value on my service. See, everyone has something to give or offer. You are naturally gifted at tasks that me, that I will never be able to do. Each person brings something unique. Romans 12, verse 6 through 7, it says, We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. What I love about the story is that Jesus doesn't devalue what Martha's good at or what she's doing. Now let's reread verse 38 real quick. It says, A woman named Martha opened her home to him. Oh. It makes sense now. It was Martha's home. Mary's the free book. <laughs> Martha opened up her home to Jesus. What do you do before company comes over? Maybe mom or dad calls you. Hey, honey, 50 minutes away. Be right there. Go. Maybe you're having a friend come over for dinner. You start cleaning like crazy, okay? All hands on deck, vacuuming, sweeping. Um, Clorox wipes running around the house with some Febreze. The kids better make their beds, even though no one's going in their room. Let's be real. There can be no signs of life in the house, guys. No one can know that you live there. Naturally, we want to make sure our guests feel comfortable, that they're well fed. If this is Martha's home, many theologians actually believe that she would have been a widow. So that means everything that happened in that house was her responsibility. Also, Jesus never traveled alone. He had, would have had his 12 disciples with him, and then anyone who was like, oh, look, it's Jesus, let me call him. So he would have people coming to the house, random people. So Martha would have greeted every single guest that came in. She would have made sure they had a spot. The house would have been clean before they got there. And she would have cooked all of their food. See, in my opinion, Martha knew the importance of Jesus and wanted to honor him through her service. See, when I, when I was serving that table, I felt so pressured to live up to the expectations of my regulars. They said, oh, Parker's so great. He's so awesome. I didn't want to disappoint them. I wanted to serve them well. So we have a conference in two weeks when people from Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina are coming right here in the very seats that you're sitting in. This is our home. This is our church. We want to take care of our space. Just like Martha prepared and catered to Jesus, we want to do the same for this conference. The church continues to impact Hampton Roads, the community, Mexico, the world, because of volunteers like you. Help impact the East Coast. In your handout today, I included a volunteer sheet. So I encourage you not only to attend the conference, but I want you to help out too. Let us know when you're available, what areas you'd like to be involved in. You can actually turn that in on the way out in the basket as you leave. Now I know what you're thinking. There's no way you'll have time to volunteer. Parker, you just went over your schedule. I'm 10 times worse. We just talked about this. Remember what I said during my story? I remember that day as the day that God moved in my life and allowed me to impact other people around me. My headache was gone, my stress was gone, my heart was full. Now, some of you are on the edge, so I want to speak to you specifically. You've got some concerns. Sam Parker, can't get off work. We have night session, 7 p.m., and it's cheaper rates. Parker, I've got kids. What am I going to do with my kids? Oh, no. We've got children's conference, and we've got a youth conference. They'll be far away from you, and you can relax and enjoy your own stuff. <laughs> so don't worry. Register your kids. The truth is that this is Martha's house for us. I want you to attend, I want you to receive, I want you to be refreshed, but I want you to serve as well. Don't miss out on what God's doing. If you want God to use you, go where you know he's gonna be and ask him to use you. But let's keep on with this story real quick. Um, my second point is my service is most refreshing when joined up with God's purpose for my life. 
My service is most refreshing when joined up with God's purpose for my life. You see, I know things can get rough sometimes. In the, the meeting that you had goes over time, which makes you late for another meeting, which makes you late to get home, which makes your kids late to practice, which makes dinner, Wendy, um, which <laughs> makes you late home. Things get so hectic, but then that one thing happens. Your boss says, I'm proud of you. Your kids say, Mom, dinner was so good. And they do the dishes. That makes a big difference, doesn't it? The little things matter. See, sometimes little things can make a huge impact. See, Jesus wasn't mad that Martha was serving him. He knew Martha had faith, but she was trapped by the necessity of her actions. She was lost the why behind the words. Why was she serving? Why was she cooking? Why did she clean? Because of who Jesus was. Because of what he was going to do. Because she would get wisdom from the Son of God. Martha was distracted and overcome by her stress. We see in Proverbs 12, it says, The diligent find freedom in their work. The lazy are oppressed by work. When we allow our stress to overcome us, we're oppressed by work. But Jesus wants us to live in freedom. I believe Martha was acting out of love and admiration she had for Jesus, but was so caught up in what she was doing that she missed the God opportunities that were going on. I almost missed my opportunity in that restaurant. I could have stayed in, stayed in my stress, but God moved. So what aren't we allowing God to do in our lives? What areas of our lives can we allow God to use us in? See, when Jesus came to Martha's house, he didn't just eat and drink and chit-chat about the latest political gossip or who's dating who in Jerusalem. <laughs> who should have won American Idol as a voice, even though we know the voice is better? See, he would have been sitting there and teaching. He would have been giving wisdom, and Martha wasn't listening. Have you ever been around someone of importance? Like someone who really just naturally commands attention. They have a lot of influence. They walk into the room, and everyone looks at them. They're waiting to see what they do, what they say. See, everything Jesus said or even portrayed would have been an example to everyone around him. So you better believe that if Beyonce walked through those doors right now, my jaw would drop. My eyes would be fixed. And I'd probably lose myself. See, Jesus would have done ten times this. Imagine seeing Jesus walk down the street. Everyone's in awe. They follow him. The way he spoke, how he spoke, the way he breathed, everything would have been an example to the people around him. Jesus knew Martha's importance. He knew her impact, her responsibilities. He didn't want her to miss out on what he had to say. So don't allow your current workload or your responsibilities or your stress to oppress you. Instead, join up with God's purpose with him and what he's doing and make an impact with your service. See, the story of Martha and Mary doesn't just quite end here. They actually have a brother named Lazarus, and he gets really sick. So they tell Jesus later on, hey, Jesus, Lazarus is sick. We need you to come. And this is what happens. When he heard this, Jesus said, the sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory that God's Son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Jesus spoke over Lazarus' life saying, it is not done yet. I'm not finished yet. There's more to come. He does the same thing over our burdens and stress. When we feel like we can't go on, he looks at us and says, Martha, there's more coming. Are you listening to me? Are you looking at me? Do you see what I'm trying to do? There's more, but I need you to pay attention. See, by the time Jesus travels back to Martha and Mary, Lazarus has been dead for four days. It says in John 11, verse 20, when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Martha stayed at home. Lord, Martha said, to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother uh, would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. God will give you whatever you ask. I feel like the tables have turned here a little bit. See, Mary is now at home, but Martha runs out to see Jesus. And let's be real, Mary's probably at Martha's home. <laughs> Just saying. But this is Martha's redemptive moment. She says, God will give you whatever you ask. She has actions and faith now, combined together. See, before, during her stressful moments, her identity was found in the completion of her tasks. But something's different this time. 
She's not letting the weight or the pressure overcome her service. She's telling Jesus, you can help, Lord. I know it. But now it would seem like a more emotionally taxing circumstance. The peace and the love of God is there with her. Now you know Martha, being the natural servant that she was, she would have planned the funeral, she would have made the arrangements, she would have let everybody know because she wanted to honor her brother that way. See, Martha doesn't seem overcome with grief. She's confident in the midst of what would normally overwhelm us. She had peace. But why? Because her actions were attached with the purpose of God. See, when we join together our jobs, our service, our actions with what God has for us, there's a natural peace that comes with it. Now, I'm not saying it becomes easy. We feel those tough moments like Martha, losing her brother. But now it has meaning. Life has meaning. Her relationship with her brother and Jesus has eternal significance. She looks at Jesus and says, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. See, she's talking about eternity here. She's confident because she knows who Jesus is, the Son of God, and what he does and what, she, what he does for her makes eternal significance. Let's see what happens next. Jesus tells Martha to go to her sister and to take him to the tomb. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there's a bad odor, for he has been there for four days. Can you imagine the thoughts of the people around them? They're looking at Jesus, they're looking at the tomb, they're looking at each other, back at themselves, they're plugging their nose in anticipation for the smell. They're confused. See, sometimes we get this place in life in our jobs and our responsibilities, our service, we're just confused. Things start piling up around us. We're unsure which way to go. We're unsure if we can go. It's frustrating. It's heartbreaking. But then this happens. Verse 40, it says, Then Jesus said, I did not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God. So they took away the stone, and Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing there, that they may know that you have sent me. When he said this, Jesus called in a loud, loud voice, Lazarus, come out! The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen, a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. This part of the story is incredibly powerful. See, we see Jesus do what no man expected him to do. He defies their expectations by meeting Mary, Martha, and Lazarus right in their home right in their mess, in their hurt, and in their pain. He speaks directly to their confusion. Did I not tell you if you believe? Can you imagine how exhausted these people have been from mourning and grieving? Martha and Mary have seen many people over the past four days, received them, received condolences, grieved together four days straight, knowing there's just more people coming. You see, Jesus doesn't ask us to serve him for his glory, for his purpose, and sit there waiting for us to finish. He meets us in that service. Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? Now, I want to take a moment to redefine what I mean by serve. I know I say that word and we instantly think of volunteering or specific actions that equate to service, but I think there's just a little bit more to that. Romans 12:1 it says, So here's what I want you to do. God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing that you can do for Him. A living sacrifice. See, there are different types of service. It's not always about additional time spent at nonprofits or community service or volunteering in the children's ministry. Though those are amazing things to do. Jesus did a lot of things. He taught and He spoke. He also washed his disciples' feet. He fed thousands of people and so much more. So what about child rearing, working, feeding, cooking, maintaining your house, spending time with your kids? I'm saying that when we bring these acts of service before God, they become meaningful. By placing your everyday lives before Jesus, they become ways to represent who he is and what he's doing in your life and how he can impact those around us, our lives, our families, our 
children, our classmates, our co-workers, they see this, they catch on to this. Our lives become ways of sharing the gospel. Our lives are acts of service. Living examples of the mission that God gives us. If our lives of acts of service, there's no way we can do this on our own. Joshua 1.9 says, Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened. Do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Wherever you go. The Bible says that our bodies are temples for the Holy Spirit, God's presence. Which means that God literally rests inside of us. And he goes wherever we go, to the gym, to work, to class, at your house, at the park with your kids. He's there with you. He promises to be there through every win, every loss. See, he's not just watching us. We see Jesus take an active role in this story. An active role in the lives of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, especially when things are tough or we take a detour. My last point, point number three, Jesus is with me in the midst of my service. Jesus is with me in the midst of my service. You know that saying, if you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. That's kind of what the presence of God does for us. The purpose of God. See, when we join our service and our lives up with God, we allow him to move through us. It's his strength. It's his peace. It's his joy. It's his love coming through us. We're not relying on our own strength. You see, he met Martha in the kitchen when she wasn't quite getting it. He looked at her. He guided her back to him. And now she sees Jesus' presence with all she has. He met me in the middle of a restaurant, in the middle of my embarrassment, in the stress of my day. He says, no, there's more to this day. I want to do through you. And he met Lazarus in a tomb. A man whose hope was gone brings his life back. See, we're not done with this story just yet. When Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, he wasn't just restoring his life. He wasn't just raising a brother to two sisters, restoring a family, mending broken hearts. He also inspired hope to everyone who witnessed it. Can you imagine seeing a dead man come back to life? Can you imagine telling someone that you saw a dead man come back to life? Not only is your life changed, but everyone that you tell, their lives are changed too. Just like Lazarus, God brings vision back to life to us. When we feel like it's dead inside. When we feel like there's nothing left for us, no physical or emotional strength to keep moving on, to keep serving, God raised to life our purpose. His spirit that lives in us gives us the rest and refreshes our soul. He gives us the strength to serve. See, when Lazarus came out of the tomb, Jesus told the people around him to take off the grave clothes. See, these clothes represent everything the enemy wants to clothe you with. Sin, embarrassment, shame, exhaustion. It restricts us from moving forward. That is his goal. But Jesus says, take off the grave clothes. Now, you know Lazarus was naked under those clothes, right? And they stripped him of those linen. So what would they have done? They would have given him new clothes. See, Jesus never takes away something old without giving us something new. Even when we feel like our past or current circumstances restricts us from going forward, we're not worthy, we can't keep moving forward. Those words that are meant to keep us down. Jesus says, drop the grave clothes, put on this new stuff that I have for you. Something that's blemish-free, something that's fresh and new and even smells good. See, we take these new clothes and we continue to serve God with everything that we have. We continue to impact our church, our communities, our workplaces, Hampton Roads, the world. See, we're called to serve. We may get overwhelmed. We may get tired. We may get off track. But God is always there to refresh us and to guide us back. See, when God clothes us with his love, the old is gone and the new is here. Past mistakes, insecurities, words meant to keep you down, are dropped. I encourage you today to put on these new clothes that Jesus is so ready 
to give you. With these new clothes, we know that serving isn't a distraction. It's a life example. It's meant to impact everyone around us. When you go after the opportunities that God has for you, change will come. It allows us to hear the words that God wants to speak to us. It allows God to strip you from the old gray clothes, take the burdens right off your back, and give you something new. We're holding a regional conference about being refreshed, not so that you'll stay here and serve us, but go out, learn things, and go out and change what you do in your everyday life. Go where you know God will be. He wants to join up with us. He wants to work through us. He has a special purpose just for you. It's completely different from mine. Only you can accomplish. And these grave clothes can apply to so many things in our lives. It's not just feelings or emotions, but it could be past mistakes. It could be regrets. It could be people in your life that aren't good for you. Jesus is saying you don't have to stay in that location. You don't have to stay in that mess, in that circumstance, with those people. I have something great for you. I have something better for you. It doesn't matter what you did in the past. I'm here to take that away, to give you something new. Everyone can receive that. It's not a special group of people. It's every single person. So I want to encourage you to do that, to step into that. In the moment, I'm going to pray, and I just really want you to take this time to focus in on what God is doing for you, for you specifically. Not about what you have to do after this, the stress that you had before that. Leave that behind. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for your faithfulness, Lord. That each one of us has a specific plan and a purpose for our lives that's only found in you. Lord, would you refresh our hearts today? Would you make the vision for our lives clear, Lord? Would you allow us to drop the distractions, drop the requirements, drop the stress, and just serve you with our hearts? May we not be distracted by our service, but we encourage others with what we do, Lord. Right now, I, I just want to speak to those who do feel trapped, who feel lost, who feel like they can't move forward, that their strength is dwindling, they're running on E. God, I, I speak over their lives and I speak refreshment in Jesus' name. I speak restoration in Jesus' name. I speak that you would drop the brave clothes, Lord, and clothe them with something new, Lord, with your love, with your grace, undeserved favor. We don't have to work to be loved by you, Lord, but you just love us. You just are. If that, if you feel like God was speaking to you through this message or during worship, I want to encourage you to trust in him this morning. I want to encourage you to drop the grave clothes this morning. Whether it's the first time or it's the 100th time, it doesn't matter. All made new every single time. So you can pray this prayer with me out loud or in your hearts. Just say, Jesus, I know there are times when I mess up. I know I've sinned. But would you forgive me of my sin? Lord, would you restore me? Would you renew me? Would your strength move in my weakness? Lord, today I trust in you. Today I follow you. Today I'm a Christ follower. In my name we pray.